All right, everyone, and good morning, and welcome to the webinar this morning. My name is Mark Musitano. Uh, I am a C senior sales engineer here at DFR Solutions. On the line with me today is Dr. Craig Hillman, the CEO of DFR Solutions. Uh, today's webinar will be on common mistakes by electronic design teams, and this is part one of a two-part series. Um, and we just want to go over some ground rules before we get started here for the webinar. So all lines are muted, so only Craig and I will be able to speak this morning. Um, if you have any questions for us, just go to the questions tab on your GoToWebinar window. Write in your question and we'll be addressing them at the end of the presentation. In addition, this webinar is being recorded and we will be posting it to dfrsolutions.com at, uh, at a, a date to be determined uh, later. It should be in a few days. It usually takes about two or three to post the website. Uh, but you can get a copy from me sooner than that. And at the end of the webinar, uh, there will be a slide in which my email information uh, will pop up on screen. So just go ahead and record that and uh, send me an email and I can go ahead and get you the, a copy of the webinar today. So with that, I'm going to let Craig take it away. Go ahead. Craig, I believe you may be on mute. Thank you, Mark. I want to thank everyone today for attending our webinar. Greatly appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to kind of learn some of the common mistakes that we here at DFR kind of observe with design teams when we uh, initiate and engage with them in regards to um, making sure that they kind of hit their customers or market expectations of quality and reliability. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with DFR, I just want to give you a couple slide indication of who we are and why we exist. So DFR Solutions, if you've not heard of us before, is the industry leader in quality, reliability, and durability of electronics. Uh, we're a very focused uh, organization. We are not generalists. We only focus on electronic materials, components, products, and larger systems. Um, and we don't compete against our customers. We're really about supporting our customers through the new product introduction process and being very aggressive and proactive, ensuring that we hit reliability goals uh, as early in the design process as possible. Uh, we think we've kind of hit a growing need in the industry to kind of be aggressive with reliability up front and being aggressive with reviewing designs, whether in-house or outsourced to a third party. We've been doing this for 12 years. We've grown every year we've been in business. Uh, we've actually built up a really nice team here at DFR. We're approaching 50 individuals uh, into a variety of areas and, and uh, engagements with our customers. And really, um, it results in one thing, which is we are able to provide our customers kind of end-to-end -end expertise, again, in kind of quality and reliability of electronics. But as you know, Quality reliability touches is has multiple touch points in the process. We make sure that we provide our customers the support they need uh, in each of those um, gates in the process. So we do it by providing a range of activity and um, support engagements. We also do it by having experts in a broad variety of areas. And I like to just highlight three that I think I'm most proud of and are kind of some of our newest areas of support, and that includes uh, batteries, an increasingly important um, aspect of electronic systems, especially with IoT, um, power supplies, both in the mechanical, thermal, and electrical designs of power supplies and some of the challenges they have in terms of affecting reliability of larger systems, and in housing and chassis, both in metal and plastics. We built up real expertise in terms of providing guidance especially in regards to how to water best waterproof and shockproof your product. So today we're going to talk about common mistakes an electronic design teams make. Uh, and the motivation, in some respects, is a positive one. If you really think about it, technology, electronic hardware, has kind of won. Right? It is really one of the largest 
and fastest growing markets in the world, right? If we compare it to like um, furniture and uh, cars and housing and roads and food and clothing and all that thing, electronics is up there, $2 trillion a year. And not only is it one of the largest markets in the world, it's still one of the fastest growing, right? So a huge opportunity for all of us uh, on the line who are involved in electronic hardware. Congratulations, you've picked the right industry, right? And we want to keep growing, right? We want to be part of a growing infrastructure, a growing organization. And so where are the biggest growth opportunities if we look kind of out in the next five to 10 years? And there's two key ones. Um, what we hear at DFR, well, there's what we call autonomous transportation. So not just autonomous vehicle, but autonomous planes, autonomous drones, autonomous railway, anywhere where there is more computer engagement in terms of controlling the transportation structure. And also not just uh, Internet of Things, but more specifically what we call industrial IoT. Um, that's where it's really more B2B, business to business. Uh, really more kind of um, how IoT is helping the business infrastructure and what's that subset of IoT is typically typically called kind of M2M or machine to machine communication. So when we think about these two areas that are really going to be the growth drivers for electronic hardware and technology over the next kind of five to ten years, um, what's special about those two areas is to remember that winners in these areas, people who will win the contracts, who will design the right things, um, that will stay paced with expectations, um, are not going to win solely on price. Both of those areas because, well, we're talking about transportation, number one, and we're talking about industrial, industrial things that where there are safety issues and lots of money at stake, quality and reliability are paramount. You've got to demonstrate, you yourself, your team, your organization, if you're releasing a product either directly to the market or to uh, a customer who is part of that market, you got to hit those quality and reliability targets. You got to surpass those quality and reliability targets. And that's going to be difficult because the environments where your product is going to sit in those two markets are extremely challenging. Um, higher temperatures, a lot of shaking, a lot of baking, a lot of corrosion, all this kind of good stuff. So kind of the days of where we can, you know, this idea of consumer electronics, right, where price win, price is paramount, right, is changing at least when it comes to electronic hardware. So if we want to compete in these growth areas, right, quality and reliability is really critical. In order for me to hit my quality and reliability targets, right, what we at DFR started thinking about and how we put together this presentation was we got to avoid the most common mistakes. And those most common mistakes can happen really at almost the earliest stage of the hardware design process. Almost a concept. In fact, I, was, uh, I had a meeting with a gentleman who talked about um, concept reliability planning, right? They're talking about reliability at concept stage. A very rare technique, very rarely implemented, but really things to think about. And really almost the key justification is why people, I want you to say reliability engineers, but people with a bent towards reliability, whether they're electrical, mechanical, thermal, materials, um, program managers, whoever, need to be kind of bringing reliability into the conversation in the earliest stages. So when we looked at common mistakes among our customers that we have observed, we saw they kind of can group them into four key categories. We call who controls what, make versus buy, right sizing, and thermal. And so I'm going to try to touch on each one of those uh, as best I can. You guys are actually in luck, congratulations, because this is actually only half the presentation, as uh, Mark was indicating. So we'll be able to go through these common mistakes in relatively short order. So hardware design, who controls what? Um, for those of you who are involved in the hardware design process, this should look really familiar to you, right? Um, Sometimes it's marketing and sales, right? You're building a product for a larger market, right? And so it's marketing's job to go out there and know the market, know what the customers want, right? But the f question becomes is, can you really build it, right? Sometimes you're building a product just for a single customer, right? Maybe you're a design manufacturer. Maybe you're a captured design team, right? So you're building it for a particular program, right? So customer's always right. 
right? But you do miss something. Is there something being lost in translation that's going to kind of cause issues in the future, right? And then there's engineering, right? In the, the day, engineering, right? You can engineering always can build something, right? But the question is, will the marketing, will the market or the customer buy it, right? And when they build it, are they satisfying or mitigating? the common kind of trade-off and tug of war that can happen between the electrical and mechanical side, right? The two key elements of the design team that really kind of make the product, but kind of have to not, not get into each other's way, so to speak. So how do we kind of mitigate the mistakes, right, in terms of this engagement with all three of these parties? So the first thing we often recommend is when we look at the product requirement document that's typically being created, we really are looking at it from a really critical eye in terms of does it actually represent actual use cases, right? Have people, have the design team, the marketing, or even um, the customer asked the question, who is going to be using it? How is it going to be used? Where it will be used? How long does it need to work, right? Are those critical elements in the product requirement document either specifically or those questions have been answered and they've kind of influenced aspects of the product requirement document? Many of my kind of called best practice customers even use a checklist at this stage. And the key thing is to avoid what you don't know you don't know, right? I didn't know the customer really needed this, and typically we don't know that because we didn't ask that question, right? Typically we spend a lot of time focusing on specs, right? Especially in the military space, uh, transportation area, right? Did it meet spec? Right? Marketing knows all about specs, typically. Uh, management likes specs because they believe if they hit the specs, they can sell the product. Right? But specs have a limited value when it comes to quality and reliability. Right? It's, meeting specs doesn't mean you've hit quality and reliability expectations. Right? Limit those specifications to kind of what we call communication protocols. Right? Especially in the IoT space, you got to be able to talk to something. Right? If you're not speaking the same language, that's not going to work. Right? And compliance requirements, right? EMI, EMC, safety, UL, all the good things, right? And so if we, we make sure we hit the specs, we always do that, right? But if we don't spend too much time on that, instead of focus on product requirements and use case and develop that ex internal checklist, we're really going to get ourselves well set up. And so what does an internal checklist kind of look like? Um, I thought I would just kind of give one example, because like I said, I want to spend um, I have a tendency to kind of ramble on in these presentations, and I'm sure your time is very valuable. But I thought I'd just give kind of one example of this, this is in terms of environment, right? So this is actually a common checklist that we push out to our customers when we're doing design reviews, or we kind of implement um, internally. Have we talked about temperature, right? How temperature changes, or how temperature is constant? Have we talked about humidity levels, and water, and moisture? Is humidity controlled? Is there a risk of condensation, right? Is it a small box that sits on a large metal structure and there's no heat in the box, right? Have we talked about other corrosive risks, salt, corrosive gases? Have we talked about electrical issues, um, power cycling, uh, electrical loads, um, transient conditions, electrical noise? Have we talked about mechanical effects, bending, vibration, mechanical shock? Right? Sometimes there are application environments where you are surprised that some of the environments actually do exist and are a concern. I'll give, actually give you a great example. We work a lot with companies in the set-top box space. Right? Cable, Fios, Verizon, right? how we get our movies to our TV. Right? We had no idea how hot the temperature is inside that box. These are state-of-the-art technology. Right? Nobody likes to have their movie um, be held up while they're watching it. So you need to have stuff that's screaming fast, high resolution, right, but no fan, right? Nobody wants to hear a fan when they're watching their favorite movie. And sometimes these set-top boxes aren't on top of the TV anymore because the TV is a flat screen, right, but it's kind of inside an enclosed some kind of cabinet, right? So no airflow, right, really stuffy, temperatures, 70, 80, 90 degrees Celsius sometimes inside that box. Um, when we talk about who controls what also, the key thing is also to embrace, in case I drew a little arrow if you guys didn't get the, the little thing with Snoopy and Woodstock, but embrace design checks 
and embrace analysis tools, right? Um, I know as a, as a manager myself, and as those of you who are managers on the phone, right, you can be really concerned about what we call paralysis by analysis, because that really is very much last century. The analysis tools that are available to engineers nowadays are really impressive and can provide information amazingly rapidly, right? And what's great about design analysis tools, it allows us to be, to kind of create a product, an agile development process that our software cousins have embraced with um, extensive fever and passion over the last kind of 10 to 15 years, right? In some respects, um, software is, on, is agile development, hardware is still waterfall, right? Part of it is because the amount of effort um, and money committed, right, once you lock that design in place, right? So if we kind of do a lot of analysis while the design is still um, flexible, Right, electrical analysis, mechanical, thermal, manufacturability, reliability, it brings a lot more agility into the design process. And what's also great is about design analysis tools, we can move away from design rules, which unfortunately um, are often arbitrary and are often the most common source of conflict between engineering and marketing, right? I mean, we understand why design rules exist. There's some product in the past where you guys did something, right? It didn't work, right? People are worried that they'll have the problem again. They don't really understand what happened, at least not maybe from a quantitative perspective, so they implement a design rule. All right, we can't have any silicon carbide fats. We can't have any connectors with palladium. We can't have anything closer to the edge than X amount. We can't have junction temperatures higher than 72 degrees Celsius, right? And so what ends up happening, especially the way um, technology evolves is at some point that design rule is going to be a source of conflict, right? And it's going to be difficult for engineering to justify it or it's going to be difficult for marketing to get around it, right? And so both sides are going to be unhappy. But if you use these design analysis tools, right, you can, you can talk about trade-offs. Okay, if we run this junction temperature at 76 instead of 72, Okay, it's going to do X in terms of performance. It's going to do Y in terms of reliability, right? If I put the component here, it means um, this, the yields will go from X to Y, right? Um, the number of infant mortalities will change by this amount. This all gets down to um, understanding what the real bottom line effects are, and we can get all this information before we finalize the build. It's a really powerful opportunity we find in terms of this who controls what process. But you can see, for example, you need these design analysis tools at this stage in order to mitigate these kind of mistakes. Um, it's also very important, obviously, the design is only as good as its supply chain, and that really often goes to manufacturability, right? You want to make sure that, um, in fact, I've seen, one of the mistakes we've seen is, again, these, these design rules, arbitrary design rules, um, have no context, right? Um, as we actually, I think one of my fellow uh, experts talked about in a, in a great internal presentation, Right? Um, I can have PCV shops that can do two mil lines and two mil spaces, or I can, they could do six mil line and six mil spaces. It all depends on the equipment that they decide to buy, the processes they decide to invest in, right? The, the more high-end the equipment, the more capable the equipment, the more expensive, right? Costs go up, right? So um, you've picked a supply chain, probably driven by cost and availability, Right? Make sure that what they have decided to focus on, their areas of expertise, is incorporated in terms of um, your design capabilities. So we've kind of defined the market, who's controlling what, how we're resolving that. Right? Now that we've identified the market or the needs or the product requirements, now we've got to decide how do we satisfy that. And there's a number of ways you can do that. And that's the, kind of the classic make versus buy. So we can do off the shelf. right? Um, buying motherboards, enclosures, peripherals. Um, you can outsource the design per what they call ODM, or Original Design Manufacturer, right? Dell and HP are, you know, are this kind of secondary um, option. They outsource their design, right? Um, and there's lots of debates and differentiations, both between Dell and HP and Lenovo, but, and, and, but even within those organizations, about how much control they have over that design, right? What kind of specifications do they do? Um, do they fully outsource the schematic and the layout? Do they only outsource the layout? 
Um, do they outsource all aspects of it, some aspects of it? How much control do they establish? And then obviously you can do it all yourself, right? You have a comprehensive design team, and you can design the schematic, the layout, the, pick the connectors, pick the enclosure, decide the ca uh, cabling, or even some combination of all three in, part, in terms of a larger system, right? We've seen this actually with, um, with some classic avionics boxes, right? There'll be 10 boards um, in an avionics box. Two of them will be, much be off the shelf. Maybe they're a, a, a classic kind of power supply or maybe some kind of communication uh, board. Um, maybe two more will be what they call kind of um, outsourced design. So this uh, tier one will go to a tier two or a tier three and say, I need you to design these relatively simple boards. And then kind of the core IP, the remaining kind of five or six boards, that's all done in source. So when we make these kind of make versus buy decisions, again, there, there are mistakes that can happen at this stage of the process, right, deciding who does what, and there are ways to mitigate that, right? So be, think, when we think about COTS, co uh, commercial off the shelf, there are significant benefits, for, especially from a management perspective, right? I don't need any money up front, right? I'm not running a check for hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars while I'm waiting for a design to be built out. Right? And sometimes some of that supply chain that's giving you this COTS already has kind of these agency certs, right? UL certifications, CE marks, right, what have you, right? However, you have to remember, um, COTS, right, what we're focusing especially this presentation on where the areas of growth are, COTS doesn't really work well for those growth areas, right? Because you're really losing or lacking information on the design and you have no configuration control. Right? So if you're going to build something for autonomous transportation and rely on, I don't know, some graphics board right, that you can find on Amazon and you're expected to supply this autonomous control for 10 years, that graphics board is possibly going to change or not be available. Right? And sometimes it can be difficult or expensive or um, not timely to try to make sure whatever you have acquired via COTS Right, is 100% compatible with the larger system that may be also outsourced or insourced from a design perspective. Right? So at least the areas of big growth for electronic hardware, you know, our recommendation would be COTS is really about very common peripherals. Right? Solid state drives, don't go out and, and design your own solid state drive right, for the most part, right? unless you have some very specific, very difficult requirements to meet. When we look at outsource versus insource, Right? Many systems are going to contain some outsourced design work. Very common, and we see very common in the military aviation world, as just one example, um, especially here in the DC area. Right? And there's some very odd values in terms of outsourcing design work, right? especially if you find a supplier that has a lot of expertise in this particular area. Right? It also allows you to kind of offload management of some supply chain issues, right? counterfeiting and um, lead free and all that kind of good stuff. And at least theoretically, if you pick the, again, you have the right contract in place, there's transparency, right? So again, especially higher, higher levels of supply chain, again, if there's questions about quality reliability or um, um, design con configuration control, you have uh, visibility into that, um, those questions. Often the recommendation we make in terms of outsource versus insource is this vendor selection is key, as kind of I was, I was indicating. And um, one way of, again, very kind of informal way of indicating that you've picked the right vendor is getting some pushback, right? If you're asking for certain functions, certain capabilities, certain geometric constraints, and all you're getting back is thumbs up yes, that's probably really a big red flag. Right? So we've talked about, um, you know, who controls what, make versus buy, right? Now we're kind of ready to actually design the product, and the two challenges we see are right sizing and thermal issues, and the two are very much um, 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 linked together. So um, most of you, when I put this up, I get a lot of nodding of heads um, in most conferences, right? Marketing wants the, uh, the latest and sleek iPad, and engineering wants to build a tank, right? And both of them for obvious reasons when we go back to who controls what. Right. With right sizing, and again, we've seen this multiple times at DFR, we really recommend trying to keep the dimensions loose as late as possible in the design process. Right? 
often what you'll see, especially when you take the classic uh, V and V approach, verification validation, which I'm not a big fan of, and I'll talk about that in a minute, right? The size requirements come flowing in first. Okay, it has to be three by four or four by five or whatever it is, right? If you push hard, you'll find these size constraints are somewhat arbitrary, and the flexibility around those size constraints is not always clearly communicated to the design team, right? And so by forcing you into a particular size box, right, you get all sorts of challenges, problems propping up in terms of thermal issues, fragility, interconnect strategies, poor choices and component selection. Let me give you a little example. So really tiny chip components, pretty awesome stuff, right? If you look at that picture there, that's a head of a match, which is hard to see in the first place. Now imagine trying to see that 01005, or if you live in the metric world, 0402, right? Really difficult stuff to put down. What you don't, may not realize is there are trade-offs. There are limitations when you go from an 0603 to an 01005, especially when it comes to capacitors. Resistors, maybe not so much, but definitely comes to capacitors. Capacitors, pretty sophisticated technology, you may not realize. So we had one customer, pushed, again, pushed a very um, arbitrary dimensional requirements. The way they were going to resolve this was going to 0201 components. Now, for capacitors, this is going back a few years now, right? But major issues across the board um, in terms of performance, quality, and reliability when they made that switch. And part of the challenge is, um, was they were in a relatively um, robust environment. The expectation was 10-year life. And when they started making inquiries, what they found, it, found out was, again, at, this, at that time, was that the overwhelming majority of companies that bought O201 capacitors were hearing aid manufacturers. Six-month life, if you're at best, because people constantly are dropping these things in the toilet, right? <laughs> So not really well aligned with their environmental needs, not really well aligned with their reliability needs, and really just a bad fit in general. So um, a great example in terms of what I call right sizing is the Toyota approach. Now, Toyota has had some bumps in the road lately, and um, we're going to kind of ignore that. I think the general approach Toyota takes is, is a major plus, right? Um, and what they try to do is really try to concentrate efforts at, at developing knowledge at the lowest possible design level. So they don't flow down requirements, so they kind of cut their V in half in some respects, right? They really want to understand the technology really well, right? And based upon that understanding, they build up a system. So they have the best technology in each aspect of the system architecture, right? The example of the radiator design, I think, is often perfect, right? And those, there was a book I read many years ago now about the, I think the release of the 1998 or 2000 model year Taurus, right? And what they talked about was, right, the, the people who, dro who drove this were the car designers, right? They were at the top of the uh, heap, so to speak, and they had designed this very sleek, beautiful Taurus that had a certain size engine. Then you had a bunch of other people who looked out in the market and said, okay, the Taurus has to have this amount of horsepower and these features. And then engineering was told, hit this horsepower, hit this features inside this, um, inside this hood space, this space under the hood, right? And so there ended up being huge fights over who got what amount of volume, how much the radiator got, how much the water pump got, how much the engine got, um, all these crazy things, right? And so you could see, I mean, in some respect they were very successful, but you could see the, 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 the craziness and the risk and the initial um, product delays because of these challenges, right? Whereas Toyota said, you know what, let me really understand radiators, right? I want a radiator expert who's testing radiators of different technologies, different sizes, understands all that, and then they kind of pick the radiator that works best and then kind of ask the designers to design the car around the best technology. So it's kind of almost like a test and design, right? rather than design and test. So the whole right sizing, you know, how big something should be, really well aligns with thermal issues, right? Because um, I can have 
heat in the box, I can potentially get that heat um, out to the box, right? But then the box becomes too small to radiate the heat, right? The smaller the box, the hotter it will get, right? And um, this radiation of heat, radiating of heat, or, or heat radiation, or thermal radiation, is actually really critical, again, in these kind of high rail, high growth opportunity applications, because most of them are not going to allow fans, right? Convection is out. You might be lucky and get conduction if you're attached to a big pole, right? But for the most part, convection is out, right? Um, worried about reliability of fans, there are the possibility of introducing um, corrosion from um, the outside atmosphere, all these issues. So how do I kind of attack the thermal issue side of thing? And we recommend kind of a three-step process, right? So step one is, again, at concept stage, there are some great rules of thumb um, that are out there, right, even before you really know kind of what the thing's going to do or, or how even, you know, only have a rough idea what the box is going to be. Uh, one of the ones that we use, that we like, is actually put out by Hoffman. They make enclosures, and they actually give you, you can see on the right here, this great little kind of estimation of temperature rise as a function of watts per square foot of the outside of the box, right? Again, it starts to give you kind of a, kind of a, uh, a rough rule of thumb in terms of are you going to have real problems you know, 40, 50 degrees C temperature rise, or kind of are you, you know, down more like in the 10 to 15 degree temperature rise, right? Where are you in terms of possible risks, right? As you're moving closer or moving along the MPI process and starting to um, develop and build out some aspects of the design, we recommend that everybody learn just a little bit of CFD or or computational fluid dynamics. It's easier than you might think. It can be a little frustrating because of these Reynolds and Neusolt numbers, which uh, give me a headache. But again, we've given you a link, not just for the Hoffman online rule of thumb, but also with for this little uh, heat sink calculator. Again, how to calculate the temperature rise in a sealed enclosure. Um, orientation is more important than you might imagine. And I'll actually, I have that in my next slide, so I'm jumping ahead. And so once you've kind of have your rule of thumb, once you've done some kind of pen and paper calculations, Really, that's when you're ready to start using some of the, the analysis tools. And that's really true for almost anything to some extent. Um, what we often see, again, best practices and what we recommend is um, you shouldn't over-rely on analysis tools. Like, don't go straight to circuit simulation tools like SPICE. Don't go straight to CFD. Don't go straight to FEA, right? You want to do some initial pen and paper calculations yourself to understand where you are. Right? But those pen and paper calculations also don't necessarily substitute for the more rigorous and robust analysis tools that eventually are required. Right? And as you're understanding kind of what the temperature rise is by running all these activities, be aware of some of the rules and approaches to optimize your thermal design, because you want to incorporate that into some of your, your analysis activities. Right? So some nice rule of thumbs uh, that we can at least put in one single slide. Like I said, orientation is more important than you might think. Right? Again, especially for uh, convection um, behavior, again, um, without fans. Right? So if you can control it, that's great. Um, if you can't control it, you better make sure that your thermals are working under worst case orientations. We've seen these issues with some of our customers. Um, the reality is um, there's not much new under the sun when it comes to thermal solutions to some extent. Right? And even those that are kind of um, to some extent new um, will have limited effects, right? So um, things to think about, and again, it's almost like a checkbox, right? Checkbox or checklists are great um, process tools to implement. So you can look at package selection, like direct fed is going to be a little bit better than like a classic TO220. Um, you have interface materials to look at, thin optimization of the heat sink, uh, PCB design, so number of layers, copper thickness, uh, copper coining, uh, thermal vias, Right? And then heat sink material, copper versus aluminum. Right? Um, paint, the color of the surface is important only when you're in the radiation, when radiation plays a more important role in terms of thermals. And like I said, so now we're without fans. Radiation, you've got radiation and convection to some extent. Right? Um, 
And so if you don't have an opportunity for much for um, a large heat sink, so it's going to be a relatively small heat sinking, right? So either it's just a metal box by itself or again, relatively small fins, um, and you're still seeing a significant temperature rise, it's amazing the improvement you can get by going from uh, a lighter color to going to black, right? It's something not, it's not to forget about. If you're lucky enough in these uh, growth areas to be allowed to use fans, Right? The optimum design is you want some turbulent flow at the heat source, and then you want laminar everywhere else right, to take that heat away. Right? If I can get turbulent flow at the heat source, I can really get almost 2x the amount of heat dissipation than if it's simply laminar everywhere. Right? Laminar flow is very good at taking the heat out, but not necessarily extracting the heat at the, the, the source of the problem. So that's kind of um, at the very early stages of crafting that design, right? So con you can call it conceptual, you can call it functional block, whatever you want to call it, right? Now we have developed a kind of that conceptual design. Now we can move on to kind of picking our components. Right. So um, how do we kind of avoid some common mistakes in picking components? So really important rule of thumb, keep it simple. Right, new component technology, very attractive. Hey, I fall in love with it sometimes too, right? Not always very appropriate, again, for these high reliability applications where we're we going after, right? Again, these growth areas. It's important to be conservative. One of the reasons is the marketing hype of component vendors does tend to exceed the actual implementation. This is the example of the O201 example I gave you where everybody was using that O201 was a hearing aid manufacturer. You see this a lot. And part of it is because the really, um, uh, uh, really, really large volumes of very, very small number of applications really kind of um, um, really t uh, tweak or, or warp kind of really how many people or how many companies are really using the product. So we've seen this, again, if you go back to chip components, if you see kind of marketing projections for chip components, You'll see, you know, 0201 might be the most popular chip component out there right now, for example, right? But that's because there are maybe 25 companies using 0201 ceramic capacitors, but each of them is, is, is putting out a billion um, products a year or something along those lines, right? So the electronics industry has a really long tail, right? And it's that really long tail where most of us live. And each of our applications and expectations and manufacturing environments um, are very challenging and may not necessarily work for these kind of very new component technologies. Right? And even when you find out that somebody like you is using that technology, be aware that sometimes modifications are made that aren't necessarily kind of projected or communicated um, through the rest of the industry. Right? can be proprietary. Um, when we pick our electronic components, one of the ways we try to make sure the components are robust is we do derating, right? Very common technique. Um, it's a practice of limiting stress on the electronic components, right, to below the manufacturer's ratings. It's kind of an interesting um, concept if you really stand back and think about it, right? You're kind of saying the manufacturer, telling the manufacturer I don't really trust you. Um, it's typically used to do three things. Right? One is to make sure that it stays functional. Right? It provides the margin of safety from deviant lots. Right? If you think that um, you have some distribution of defects and the uh, electrical stresses or the thermal stresses is some distribution of stress. If I pull back on the stress, I'm going to have less likelihood of having those two distributions overlap. And also allows some desired operating lifetime. Right? Temperature does play a critical role in lifetime. Um, wire bonds. Uh, dielectric breakdown, electromigration, uh, capacitor evapor electrolyte evaporation, all those good things, right? And the way we make sure that we are hitting our D ratings is we typically do some kind of component stress analysis. So um, all sounds nice and good. Everyone's very familiar with it. So how do we vote to avoid some of the common mistakes when it comes to D rating? So um, what we see typically in terms of D rating mistakes is two things. One is, we actually didn't do the derating we thought we did. Um, and it falls into two categories. When we talk about analog and power designs, um, derating is typically overlooked during transient events, especially turn on, turn off. Right? So we're looking at it in a, in a static way. But let's say you may have, a, on a, may have an application where it's turn on once a day or turn on twice a day. Right? And each one of those turn ons 
You have a very quick transient event. It could be microseconds. It could be milliseconds. But during that event, voltages are very high. Our currents are very high, right? It really slams those components. Um, or on the flip side, we have digital designs. Typically, everything is operating off a, a, a certain bus, right? A 5 volt bus, a 3.3 volt bus. Things to be much more controlled in a digital arena, right? Requires a lot less black magic. But then we have issues where there's so many components and so many connections, people kind of do a lot of shortcutting, right? They only look at the most critical aspect of the digital design or where the biggest changes have been done and not really understanding the risks throughout the entire digital architecture. The second way DRAM mistakes are made is actually almost the opposite. So it's not that derating wasn't done, but it was done in a way that's not really practical, right? Um, theoretically, it should have a practical scientific foundation, right? And there are, actually are situations where really aggressive derating is not always better, okay? Um, and so you have to be aware that um, we sometimes, not only does the derating not always have a strong foundation, you should also be aware that the rating doesn't always have a strong scientific foundation. In fact, what I find often really funny is if I get myself in, into a room full of reliability engineers, there can be rather heated um, arguments over what the derating rules should be. I have customers who constantly are asking me for derating handbooks that they can follow. But what they don't understand is the rating themselves are driven more by tradition and market forces than by science. And so let me give you an example right here. And I've actually got another one in my head. So this is a, um, a, a wonderful little table um, released by Kemet in one of their technology uh, reports that they have on their website. And its purpose was to demonstrate how robust um, the new version of tailing capacitors with a polymer cathode um, was. Right, so you can see I've kind of cut off part of the table because I wasn't really interested in the marketing aspect of the polymer, the tail and polymer capacitor. I was much more interested in what this thing was saying about the traditional capacitors with manganese dioxide cathodes. And what you'll see is, right, um, what they're trying to show you is um, the failure rate for manganese dioxide cathodes is roughly 10 ppm at startup, but at 50% derating, but for the polymer, you can get up to, you can get that same failure rate at like 80 or 90% derating, right? But then my question was, why can't I get a 10 part per million failure rate at the rated voltage for the old talent capacitor? Since when, it is, where does the rating come from that if I use it at 100% rated, 0.3% of the capacitors will fail on startup? I mean, think about some of the larger, more complex designs you could have 10, 20, 30 talent capacitors on a board, right? So now what you're talking about is there can be a failure rate of like 10%. 10% of the boards could fail at startup just because if I'm using 30 talent capacitors at the rated voltage, right? So where does this come from? Part of where this comes from is when talent capacitors first came out, there were a new technology, there was a lot of defects. The whole kind of uh, self-healing process had not been fully optimized. And the major um, vendor, or sorry, vendor, the major consumer of this technology was military. So how did the military deal with this, right? Um, the way they dealt with this is they developed a derating system, right? And that became kind of a default way of dealing with things. And that whole military derating system kind of eventually got incorporated and adopted by um, the commercial world as well, right? Another example I can think about in terms of like, you know, um, tradition and, and marketing is we were looking at two component vendors for high temperature um, products. Both components from two different vendors rated to 150 degrees C, right? But based on testing of those two components and conversations with the uh, customers, one group decided that 150 degrees C, right, had a very limited lifetime, so it was only designed to be used at 150 degrees C for short periods of time, and that was primarily because this was, that component vendor was selling into the automotive market, right? Another component vendor running at 150 degrees C was selling into the aviation market, 
And so for them, 150 degrees C meant it had to be 150 degrees C robust for tens of thousands of hours. So same rating, 150 degrees C, right? Um, kind of confirmed and designed lifetimes completely different based upon the two different markets they're selling to. And you would never know that pulling up the data sheet. So something to think about, right? What we often recommend in terms of the derating decision tree, um, try to derate based on the component performance, not the ratings, right? Um, best practice, do it off fill returns if you can, right? Ask yourself the question, right? Is there really a clear difference if you have one product with parts running at 60% rate of voltage, another product running at 50% rate of voltage, right? Are they coming back to from the field at two different failure rates, right? Um, you can also do some what we call test to failure qualification, almost like a halt for components, right? Um, it's gonna, these are going to be expensive activities, so if you can do it, you probably want to limit it to the um, critical components. Um, if you can't do that, or if you only do it for a certain number of components, next stage is um, ask the manufacturer how you should derate it, right? And that's how we found out this 150C for 1,000 hours versus 150C for 10, 20, or 30,000 hours was by simply asking the question. It's amazing how many of my customers just for some reason don't pick up the phone and call the component vendor. Lots of nice people there. They don't always care whether you're buying one or a million, especially if they're fellow engineers, right? Um, the customer's always right. So if those two things don't work, right, the customer may have some sort of requirements. And then really only step four is when you start working off the standard. Right? And even when you're working off the standard, make sure that you're flexible. Don't be absolute. We've probably seen more failures where people were rigid with their derating requirements than where people had a, gave themselves a little bit of flexibility. Right? Uh, you know, our internal recommendation is 66%, but I went with 70. Right? We don't see a catastrophic um, failures when they go up, but when they switch from an aluminum heat sink to a copper heat sink because they can't hit 95 degrees C junction temperature, right? That copper heat sink goes flying off when there's a shock event or where there's any kind of, any kind of vibration. Um, the last kind of uh, common mistake that I'll talk about gets into the electrical world, which I will admit I have no degree in, right? But I actually see this quite often among my team when they report it back to me when they're doing design reviews, is power sequencing. So power sequencing is actually quite interesting. It's when I have two integrated circuits um, on different power rails so V1, V2, right? Um, but they are still connected in some way. And so if you're not careful about how those two integrated circuits are powered up, there's a risk you can get high current flow through one or through both, and then you can have a latch up condition, right? The reason why it's one of the most common electrical mistakes is, you know, it's again, it's kind of that electrical versus mechanical where we find things get dropped, same situation. It's often a blend of the digital and power design, right? So you have a digital architecture person, you have a power architecture person, they're not solely always talking to each other, or the digital person's designing the whole thing but not really thinking about power, right? Um, failure is not always immediate. It can be a big reason for one of those no fault founds that is very kind of like drives people crazy, right? It can be difficult to test um, and also difficult to identify when you do have kind of permanent failures. It can be difficult to identify root cause. All you know is there's an EOS event, right? Um, and even when you kind of know power sequencing is a problem and you're making a, a big effort, we find a lot of teams only focus on half of the problem. They're focusing on what happens during turn on. They're, having, they're developing really good practices for turn on, not really thinking about what happens when things turn off. Um, so, um, High current flows can damage the IC over time due to elevated temperature. Um, it can also get the IC to behave erratically. Um, and again, if you think about um, how this causes failure, again, it can cause failure that's not always being communicated to you. So one of the classic examples is, I'm sure we all have technology in some way, shape, or form that for some reason kind of freezes or acts weird, and then we have to do a power cycle, right? Why is that? Right, you ever think about that? Why well, a power cycle kind of clears everything out? There's a number of reasons for it, depending upon the technology, but again, one of the more common ones is this latch up situation. We're getting kind of, one of the ICs is kind of getting um, stuck in a certain position, depending on the complexity of the IC and 
which rails um, parts of the IC are connected to. It may not be the whole IC. It may only be a certain functionality within that integrated circuit. How do we avoid this common mistake? There actually are three methodologies. They're called sequential, ratiometric, or simultaneous sequencing. Um, the method to use and the order of the sequence is going to vary, um, especially for complex integrated circuits. It's really about kind of being, again, upfront with that manufacturer, asking them for guidance, and then also kind of the overall circuit design around those integrated circuits. So this is kind of um, some indications of how you do it. So sequential se sequencing, each power supply is separately sequenced, so the next supply will not come up until the first one is regulating, right? So that's a little bit easier to implement, right? Um, for ratio metric sequencing, each power supply starts together and ramps up and down at the same time, right? That implementation is really good depending upon the power supplies that are supplying voltage to those rails, um, what, which ones are they? It's not really as common. Um, you can also do simultaneous sequencing, right? So here, each power supply ramps up together at the same voltage until they start regulation, right? Again, implementation um, not as common, right? Um, as the sequential sequencing, right? But again, there can be limitations in terms of timing, in terms of um, space available that may not necessarily allow you to do sequential sequencing in the first place. So in conclusion, I have a surprise conclusion for everybody. The conclusion is attend part two of this presentation. So my colleague Michael Blateau will be talking about the second part of the presentation. They'll focus more on the mechanical elements of the design, um, housing, uh, physics of failure, and they'll kind of wrap up that presentation with an overall conclusion in terms of avoiding common design mistakes. In the meantime, for myself, I want to thank everybody for attending this presentation. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to contact myself or Mark Musitano. And looking forward to seeing you guys on the presentation next week. All right. Thank you, Craig, uh, for that great presentation. Um, looks like we have just a few questions here rolling in. Um, a couple people thanking you for the training, so that's always good to see. And I see we have a question here about when will the slides be available. Um, so the slides will be available, uh, as I said at the outset of the webinar. Uh, if you want to take down my email, and I am Mark Musitano, uh, just email me directly and I can get you a recording of the webinar uh, right after this. So please feel free to do that if you're interested. Uh, as for the slides being posted to our website, that will take a few days, but they should be up there relatively soon. Um, now, Craig, we do have a, a question for you here. Um, and it's more of a comment, actually. It says that D rating looks like something to investigate more than I, in, or more that I initially, though, it's not uh, more than, I guess, I guess they meant to say more than I initially thought. Um, so that, that's good that uh, people are kind of taking that out of your presentation. Uh, if anybody else has any questions, I do want to give you a chance to write them into the questions bar. Uh, so if you'd like to do that, you can do that now as I'm kind of wrapping up the presentation. Just as a note, uh, we will have another, uh, another presentation at 2 p.m. Eastern time today if you'd like to attend that. If you feel like you missed anything or want to sit through in on this again, please feel free to sign up for the 2 p.m. Eastern webinar today. It will be the exact same webinar that Craig gave. And then, of course, uh, please do follow his advice and join us next week with uh, Michael Blatteau on part two of this presentation. Uh, so I'm not seeing any additional questions, so we're going to go ahead and close out the presentation uh, at this point in time. Thank you for attending, everyone, and have a great day.